SVS. I'm here with Nick Brown, and Larry Magoo from SVS. We're going to be talking the next hour about taking immersive home theater to the next level, just refining what we want to know, we want to answer all your questions, and just have a great time talking about how we can make your home theater experience better. Larry, how you doing? I am great, sir. It is so good to see you. It is, uh, it's been too long since we've been in person. I know we just did a uh, virtual event not that long ago, but I miss seeing your face and everybody there in Omaha. So I'm looking forward to getting a chance to see everybody again. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, Russell, why don't you tell about who you are and where you're at, and yeah. then uh, we'll come back. Sure. So Russell Weaver, I'm here in our Omaha, Nebraska location at uh, NFM. Uh, I am the smart home service manager. We take care of our installation for home theater and cameras and smart functions. And we do uh, uh, residential and commercial properties. Uh, we do everything from theater design to basic, hey, we want to hang this on our wall in our bedroom TV. Uh, I always joke around basic to bonkers, but we get everything taken care of for you. <laughs> Very cool. And I love your backdrop there, Russell. That's uh, some real styling you did there. And, and once we blow you up on the screen, you'll be able to see it a little better. But uh, just phenomenal uh, product selection you've gotten you've gotten set up there. Yeah. And uh, my name is Larry Magoo. I am the national training manager for SVS, and I would normally be traveling the country, interacting with our retail partners, and educating them on our brand, and engaging with our uh, customers that are out there in the field. And uh, that shifted over the last two years to where I've been doing all that virtually, hence these uh, also virtually interactive events. And I've worked with Nick now for nearly six years. And so I will pass it over to Nick and let him introduce himself and tell you what he does for us. Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, I'm Nick Brown. I'm the VP of Marketing for uh, SVS. So uh, I'm probably the least uh, intelligent person in this room right now, which is why <laughs> I'm going to be moderating and, and helping facilitate the questions and, uh, and information from these two AV geniuses. Uh, we're super excited. Uh, for some of you, I I've seen some of the comments uh, who may have attended the first one. We did a, a sort of a talk about all the basics of setting up a home theater the first time around. And we're going to cover some of that uh, on this talk, but we're actually going to deep uh, dive a little bit deeper and get into some of the uh, more finer points of calibration and choosing some products and some new emerging technologies that I think people may not be uh, totally up to speed on. So very excited to do this, uh, taking immersive home theater to the next level. Uh, so as part of this evening, there is also going to be a giveaway. Uh, the giveaway we're going to be doing is a prime wireless, or I'm sorry, prime satellite 5.1 system uh, that includes our SB1000 Pro subwoofer. And it also includes our SoundPath cables so we get all the cables you'll need to connect that uh, as well as five prime satellite speakers to have your surround sound system and a sb1000 pro subwoofer and what's cool about that subwoofer larry it's a real subwoofer first and foremost if you look at a lot of those home theater systems you buy that are pre-packaged they're normally the biggest sacrifice is the subwoofer and this is a true 12 inch subwoofer with uh, immense power, digs deep, can take on music, movies, gaming, and everything, and uh, really an over-the-top system. And the full 5.1 you get right there, you can make, uh, it's great for a living room, a small room, a bedroom, a uh, full-on den, wherever you're going to put it. And the subwoofer itself, you can use our subwoofer control app as well via Bluetooth, which I know Russell loves too. Very much Allowed so. you to really do some fine tuning and adjustments on it as well. Yeah, that 5.1 system, by the way, we have that sitting out uh, on the floor. And by comparison, the way the speakers feel, they look, I mean, it is a fantastic system. It is a heck of a giveaway. And for uh, people who are leaving comments, you're already eligible for that giveaway. That's all you have to do is uh, leave a comment, ask a question. We have uh, some folks working behind the scenes to gather those questions. We'll be doing a Q&A towards the end of the broadcast. Uh, and then we'll choose somebody at random and announce the winner live uh, as we wrap up the uh, the event this evening. So very excited to give that away um, you know, to some uh, lucky recipient later on today. Uh, so to dive right into things, I, I know, uh, you know we like to sort of talk about the display technology first, because you can't really have a home theater unless you have a display. And you know, I know at uh, Nebraska Furniture Mart, you have a lot of different demo facilities. So you can see everything from a projector to 4K to curved screens, every possible technology out there. So Russell, why don't you get things teed off and talk a little bit about the offerings that you guys have and then what you should be looking for as far as the display and, and things to consider. Absolutely. For, so the 
the plug for NFM in terms of being able to see what is out on the market, we have everything, everything for a small, large television, uh, 4K, 8K, traditional overhead projection, short throw projectors, which are getting extremely popular. Uh, and then really some of the newer stuff that's on its way out, uh, what they call direct view L, uh, LCD or LED, uh, to where there are small square, you pick your resolution and you build it up to a 300 inch screen size. Uh, so next time you thought to yourself, man, 300 inch in that bedroom just makes sense. Good news, we can take <laughs> care of you. Uh, but when we're discussing with the customers about what to pick, uh, usage in the room is by far the most important thing. We have customers that come in that have a room dedicated for watching movies. And obviously a projector system is gonna give you that theater experience. But then we have other people that have a multi-purpose or a multi-use room, that it's a living room, that they're not gonna want a screen sitting there all the time, uh, just taking up space or a motorized screen they're gonna be you know, paying more money for. Uh, so we have a direct view television uh, that will be available up to a 98 inch for what some people consider a reasonable price. But that direct view television, you don't have to worry about how bright the room is or the screen material it's projecting onto. It is a direct view television. You can place it on the wall, on furniture. There's a great example of our, uh, our projector room. Uh, so if you look on the ceiling there, traditional overhead projector, but on the left and the right, that little white box there is that ultra short throw. That's the Samsung triple laser uh, ultra short throw. I believe it's eight and a half inches away from the wall for a 110 inch screen size. It is fantastic for people that don't have the ability to start punching holes in their drywall, dragging wires through the ceiling, getting an electrician to put an outlet there. It gives a lot of flexibility. Unfortunately, I can't do it. Uh, I have been suckered into getting cats and cats like to lay on warm things. And so it just doesn't work out for me. But when we have this discussion with our customer, what they're gonna be using for the room that it's gonna be in, uh, the type of lighting situation, all of that plays into effect on what is the best screen or type of uh, display device to use. Uh, if we're talking that next generation, 8K televisions, there's a lot of buzz about 8K TVs right now. And those 8K TVs uh, are incredibly sharp, incredibly bright as well, but the problem we're running into is content. So if you are one of those customers that say, I want my content to match my television, we're not quite there with 8K. But I always make the argument for this customer that's even asking about it, your 4K TV isn't always showing 4K content either. If you're watching your nightly news, you're watching uh, your, your regular you know, friends reruns, whatever that would be, all of that is a lower resolution. What your TV has to do is take that low resolution signal and up convert it to match the pixel count on your television. 8K TVs do the exact same thing. The higher the resolution you feed it, the better it's gonna look. It's less up conversion the TV has to do, but that's what really differ differentiates a good TV from a great TV is the software and the hardware that it uses to take that low resolution signal and up convert it. So and let me right stop you now, there for a, yes. a second, Russell, because I, I do want to define what actually 8K is in uh, in comparison to 4K. So, Larry, uh, in case some people might not know, what, what do those terms actually mean as far as, uh, you know, the, the resolution and what you're seeing? Well, it's really what you're seeing on the screen. So if you've been around TVs for a while, you know, went from standard def to high def, and then we went from high def to 4K. So we went from SD TV to HD TV to now 4K and now 8K resolution. So really it's just more information on the screen, higher detail, more color depth, uh, just an overall better picture. And kind of where Russell was growing, going is that whenever um, you were introduced to 4K, you necessarily didn't have uh, content immediately available to you. And now it's kind of gotten to where it's everywhere, whether it's streaming, it's on disc, it's on YouTube, there's all kinds of 4K content available to you. And now we're getting to where 8K content is starting to become a thing. And I know the Olympics probably aren't as big a deal as they normally are right now, but they were even broadcast in some areas in 8K. So I'm seeing tons of compliments on this room. And Russell, maybe you should clarify that this isn't actually your living room, but uh, maybe <laughs> paint a picture of what you can experience at NFM here if, uh, if you actually head to one of the retail locations. Absolutely. So uh, in our this is particularly in our Omaha location, but in our Dallas and our uh, Kansas City location, we have rooms similar to this. But what makes this room great is 
when we first built this room to do what we wanted to do, which is a true Atmos surround sound experience, we were the first in Oma to have a true Atmos in this room. We have a 7.2.4, which means we have our seven ear uh, level speakers, our two subwoofers in the corners, and then our four overhead speakers. And that gets us a, a great uh, uh, experience for an Atmos surround sound track. So if you have, if you're in a situation where you're seeing all these movies being broadcast on Disney Plus on HBO, or you're buying movies and they're uh, encoded in that Dolby Atmos surround sound, this is how you can experience it before. If you're not sure what it's going to do for you, this is where we can really show you that 3D audio. And that is the big push for Dolby Studios and now DTS and IMAX experiences. All of that is that 3D audio experience. So in this room, we can not only demonstrate our video, but really do a good solid job of showing what a true Atmos surround sound experience can do for you. So going down the display path even further, are people still buying curved TVs? Is that still a thing? So what you need to do is get in a DeLorean, 88.8 .8 miles an hour. <laughs> and then, yeah, so nobody's doing curved screen TVs anymore. Uh, my own personal view on that is uh, it was kind of that gimmicky, hey, let's, let's find a way to push the market because the resolution isn't going to do it because everything's moving that 4K. They didn't have a next horizon. Uh, the idea is, hey, I can get that viewing angle, which is great. But quite truthfully, uh, I think what really pushed them out is when we started seeing those better versions of the flat screen TVs, the full array uh, back, backlit TVs and the self-lit like the OLEDs and that QLED and the quantum screens, all of that where it actually made the picture better is where we, I, I think that's where it really pushed it into, hey, let's just make a better TV. So fair to say curved screen's not gonna take immersive home theater to the next level. It, no. it just, it just <laughs> isn't. But okay. when, we are, when we are talking about that immersive experience, we really wanna have that conversation with the customer of what is this room used for? And if this is, no, I want that immersive experience, I always, I, first thing I ask, you go to a movie theater. If you're coming in and m making this investment in a surround sound system, a projector, or a big, a big flat panel TV, you probably go to the movie theater. And where do you sit? Are you that back row customer? Or are you that front row watching movies? It's, it does make a difference. And uh, you have a lot of formulas out there. One and a half times the screen size or two and a half times the screen size is where you should be sitting on there. When we're talking about a 4K resolution with a 4K uh, signal, you can be right against the television. That's what makes it so great is that that lifelike experience. So really comes down to what we're looking for when that customer is sitting down in that room. And if they want that, I want to be in the movie situation. Absolutely. Get you set up with a beautiful 120 inch light rejecting screen. I can have lights on. I can have my projector going. I can have people around and I don't have to worry about uh, losing that immersive experience. That's great information. And um, I do want to move on, but quickly before we uh, we get to receivers, Larry, maybe provide just your, your top uh, tips for placement of a screen in terms of where it should be relative to the seating, uh, on the wall, in an ideal scenario to really get the most out of it. Well, I, ideally, you know, if you don't want it up too high. You want it kind of even with where you're going to be sitting. But also a big part of it is, uh, I think, setting up the image. And I think so many people plug in a TV straight up out of the box and leave it in vivid mode. And yeah, it pops and it's bright, but the color's not necessarily accurate. And if you're going to turn off the lights, it can be a little fatiguing on your eyes. So all the TVs in our house, I've got set where we have kind of a daytime setting and then a, a lights down setting. And I tend to use the cinematic mode or movie mode, or some TVs have a THX or a calibrated mode. And that will really, it tends to not only be a little bit easier on your eyes, but it's a sharper overall image, gives you a little bit more color, more detail, and more true to what the director, the editor, the the creator intended on their end too. Russell, anything you want to add to that before we move on? Absolutely. On most of our panels that are, like Larry was saying, set for retail environment. It pops, it's really bright, but not only will you get that eye fatigue that you talked about, it's just not anywhere close to what real life is. Uh, so, for example, most retailers and installers, like ourselves, offer a calibration service. So after a month or two of using it, call us up. We have a calibration service, hook up a camera to the television, runs through a PC, 
gets you the, uh, the accurate reproduction of your red, blues, and greens. Some TVs do a better job of calibrating than others, but it makes a difference of getting, like Larry was saying, what the filmmaker was trying to reproduce or was trying to capture on your screen. Excellent. Well, I think that's a good uh, sort of overview with uh, of the video side of things. And I think the next step that people generally have when uh, putting together a home theater would be the AV receiver. You got to have the brains and the, the muscle to actually get your speakers to make some uh, some noise. And so, Larry, what would your uh, what would you say are the important things to look for as far as when you're choosing an AV receiver to really get to that next level? Well, I, I want to I see a ton of comments coming in. We're going to get to a lot of these. You guys are asking about dual subs and difference in ported versus sealed. So that's going to come up in a minute. So don't think we're ignoring you. Uh, but the receiver, I will tell you, to me, is just as, if not more important than the screen, because that's going to be the lifeblood. That's going to be the brain. That's where everything is going to run through in a true surround sound system. So this is even an older receiver here. Uh, but you will take all of your hookups, so your streaming boxes, your gaming systems, your satellite or cable boxes, anything that you're going to hook up to your system is going to run through your AVR. So we mentioned 8K televisions earlier. A lot of receivers now, even if you don't have an 8K TV now, you probably will down the road. So you know, get one that's got 8K capabilities, as many HDMI inputs as you can get. Power isn't necessarily the biggest thing you need to be looking at because most of the speakers you're going to be picking up that's going to run off of an AVR will run just fine off of 80 watts per channel. But if you're going to be doing a much larger kind of over-the-top system, you'll probably have two pieces to this. You'll have a an amplifier and a preamp, and then you'll have additional components and stuff to go with that. And we, we won't spend a lot of time on that tonight, but if you're going to be investing in a living room or a home theater setup, the receiver really is important. And, and you know, in my living room downstairs, we have eight things connected over HDMI. Here in our game room, uh, media room, we've got probably six or seven things connected to between the various gaming systems and uh, our 4K players and all of that stuff too. So really connectivity is key and making sure that you're future-proofing yourself. So most receivers you look at now will have the ability to do Dolby Atmos and then we'll do seven channels or nine channels or even 11 channels. So future-proofing is really key. And Russell, would you say, you know, brand to brand, are there big variances in how AV receivers perform or, or you know, you, you've obviously dealt with a lot of different models and, and uh, technology there. So I'm curious what you can tell us about, you know, if you're going through the process of choosing one, things to consider. Yep. I, I do a lot of car analogies when I'm describing receivers. <laughs> Any car will get you from point A to point B. It's a matter of luxury, you know, how quiet the ride is, smooth and all that. Audio video receivers are very similar. Is there are absolute difference is in performance, but matching that performance with what you're investing in your speakers makes sense. By no means are you going to get, you know, a top end sports car and then put go-kart tires on it and then go. It does not, it doesn't make any sense. So when we're talking about receivers, generally speaking, uh, the first conversation we had is again the display. Do we need to make sure that we're using this to switch between my HDMI components or am I using my TV to do some, my switching and I'm dumping my audio out? Am I using my TV? Do I need ARC because I'm using my TV's uh, built-in streaming services and then dumping my audio out of that into my receiver? All Actually, that Russell, there. I'd love to stop you there. You mentioned ARC and actually I think there's some confusion around ARC or just understanding when and why you use it. Maybe we uh, deviate for a second and, and give a quick explanation since I do think it's important. Yeah, absolutely. So. Your televisions in the past have had a number of audio outputs. Uh, so generally speaking, as TVs got thinner and thinner, your speakers got smaller and smaller and they sound like garbage. So <laughs> what happens is we need to find a way to take that audio out of that television and dump it into your sound system. Uh, in the past, uh, way back in the day, it was a stereo left and right, your red and white connection. And then it advanced to that optical output, uh, toss link, whatever you'd like to call it. Uh, and then it moved to an HDMI connection. So one of your HDMI connections on your television will always be uh, labeled an ARC or eARC. And that stands for an audio return channel or enhanced audio return channel. And what that allows you to do is to use the output on your uh, audio video receiver uh, and then that ARC input. That allows me to take anything that's being processed inside the television and dump that audio back into my sound system. Now, the difference between ARC and eARC, generally, besides bandwidth and some other techie things, is 
a standard surround sound versus an enhanced like Adobe Digital surround sound. I'm sorry, Adobe Atmos surround sound. Uh, but it's all the same concept of I'm able to use my HDMI, which is going to give me a wider bandwidth, more information, a clearer sound, less compression than I would ever get out of an optical connection. But that arc is pretty standard on most TVs and almost all of my audio video receivers. That monitor output that goes to your TV operates as your arc connection. Good explanation. Um, Larry, I know you mentioned that most receivers will be fine in terms of powering your system, but say you wanted to do, you know, seven ultra towers around your living room. Um, we are taking our home theater to the next level. So at what point would you want to consider separate amplification and, and sort of what's the process and the thinking there behind uh, moving beyond the AV receiver to actually power your, your speakers? Well, there, there are limitations to surround sound receivers. You know, they're, they're really meant for smaller tower speakers, uh, not running a big, huge, over-the-top 13-channel surround sound system. So that's where running uh, separate components comes into play, where you've got an amplifier and then a processor. So they will communicate with each other to recognize the signal that's coming in, feed the power to the speakers individually. So giving them more juice, more output, which allows you to, at lower volume levels, I experience a better uh, overall sound, but also when you do crank it, it's got that extra energy there for you too, but you are able to do more speakers. So a conventional receiver, you're probably going to do most of the time seven speakers. Uh, you'll have your conventional five, which we'll talk about in a minute, maybe two additional height effect speakers. Uh, but when you start going beyond that, that's where some receivers start getting limited until you get into the higher performance receivers that are meant for a few more. But then you start adding additional cost. So a lot of people will do maybe a, a basic receiver, kind of like you see here, or a, an amplifier and an app add additional processors that allows them to add more speakers. And so if you're going to be doing, like Nick said, our ultra towers and going to do five of those all around you, they need more power. Because when you're using a, a basic receiver, it is sharing that information to all of those speakers. So adding additional amplification can benefit you. It's not necessary for everybody, but whenever you are stepping into higher end speakers or additional equipment, it, it will absolutely make a difference. So obviously buying a receiver that's future-proofed has enough channels to support your ultimate goal to build the ultimate uh, immersive home theater, uh, making sure it has enough power to uh, to get all those speakers enough juice to sound as good as possible. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously uh, having as many HDMI uh, outputs as you, you would ever possibly need, I think is uh, is sort of the, the third piece of advice. Russell, anything else to add about AV receivers and source components before we move on to uh, speakers and surround sound? No, the only thing that I would add is when you're looking at receivers, amplification versus processing. That's a big thing right now that I can uh, process 14 channels, but I'll amplify nine or vice versa. So make sure that when we're talking about building that ultimate system, that we're matching the processing with the number of speakers and all that. And that's the nice thing about having a system designer does it for you. Just say, this is what I want. And like, great, I'll put it together for you. Good times. Absolutely. Uh so that was our sort of quick, uh, you know, and, and uh, fast update on AV receiver technology and source components. Now we wanted to get into the surround sound, the speakers, what you're actually going to be hearing. And and last time we went through each individual channel, so I don't think we're going to necessarily do that. But traditionally, when you're building a surround sound home theater, you have a 5.1 as your starting point, uh, two front, left and right, a center channel, and then your rear surrounds. So uh, what I wanted to start with was, a, was an explanation from you gentlemen on what your choice is between upgrading from that 5.1 to a 7.1 or a 5.1.2, and then obviously get into a little talk about Dolby Atmos here. So uh, Russell, I'll kick that one to you first. Maybe define what that 7 point is, 7.1 versus the 5.1.2, and then what your preference would be. Absolutely. So that first uh, number is always your number of best case scenario ear level speakers. Not always, but usually an ear level speaker. So if we're talking a 7.1 system, in addition to your front three, your rear two, it's usually your side two. Uh, sometimes it's front height, but it's generally a side two. Um, when, we're, when we're talking to a customer about what that upgrade should be, are we moving to an Adobe Atmos? And that's when we add that, that third set of numbers is the number of height channels you're normally gonna, gonna get. Um, for me, it is all about that room configuration. Doesn't make sense to 
uh, to be in a room. Like my living room upstairs isn't really made that well for an Atmos system. It's vaulted open and it's got this goofy pillar right in the middle that would block right where one of the channels. It just doesn't make any sense for me to do that. Uh, so getting a good five or seven one system all at ear level is the way to go. Uh, also, when we're talking to customers and we're retrofitting in those Atmos speakers, those overhead speakers, uh, it doesn't always work out that way for the customer. Uh, so when we talk about those Atmos channels or getting those height channels, sometimes I know SVS makes a great option for a height channel, something that can sit on top, reflect off as if uh, it's built into the ceiling, uh, which side note, usually when we're talking about building an Atmos system, speakers built into the ceiling for that 3D audio effect really is the ideal situation. And so I went on off on a complete tangent there. No, that, that's all right. You know, I, I think I sort of led you down that tangent. But, you know, ultimately we want to talk about uh, Dolby Atmos. But I think when you're talking about speaker placement and just choosing uh, how you're going to have your speakers set up, uh, you have to consider the room. And, you know, almost no room is perfect. And I have this uh, this home theater that's that we're looking at here, which is sort of a very odd configuration they have. They have a bookshelf. They have a, a dipole surround. They have a prime elevation here. Uh, but they're making the most of the space that they have. Um, you know, so to sort of back up what, in terms of describing what Atmos is, it's, it's basically object-based surround sound. It allows you to pinpoint sounds coming from individual uh, points in space, and it creates this sort of bubble of immersive sound all around you that you wouldn't traditionally get from that single plane of 5.1 surround sound. And so when you're talking about Atmos speakers, there's traditionally been uh, four different options. There's the, the bounce effect where you have these little toppers that are on the front stage. They sort of shoot sound off the ceiling. And theoretically, it reaches your ear and makes you think that you're hearing sound coming from overhead. Now, the issue that you get with that sometimes is if you have a vaulted ceiling or sort of architectural effects, uh, track lighting, as you see here, that can be a pretty inconsistent experience. You're not always getting uh, the right dispersion characteristics and it can be sort of unrealistic. Um, you know, that's why we designed Prime Elevation the way we did. And then there's also in ceilings, which I think you did mention, which provides a, uh, a better experience, but there's still limitations from using architectural speakers in that they can't uh, necessarily be full range. And then you're also cutting into your ceiling. Larry, why don't I kick it to you to tell what the vision behind Prime Elevation was and how it delivers uh, Atmos height effects versus some of the other solutions. Well, I guess I haven't seen this picture. This room is cool. So it, it took me a second to kind of figure it out. So what we're looking at is actually the back and kind of side of this room. So that speaker in the very far back corner on the gray wall in the midway, that is a rear surround speaker. And up above it is going to be a rear height effect speaker. That is the prime elevation. And as Russell was saying, there's three ways to get that height effects experience up above you. You can do a speaker built into the wall or this, or sorry, built into the ceiling aiming down. You can do one of those toppers that reflects and kind of emulates and creates the sound up above you. Or you can do a speaker like we have there, the prime elevation. This room I'm in here is like a 12 by 12 bedroom. And it's where we do, it's my office and our game room. And we've got what's called a 5.1.2 in here. The front, the center, the surrounds, and then two height effect speakers. And the prime elevation, uh, let's see, got it right there on my wall. You can see it's kind of angled down like a movie theater speaker. And I'm going to go blurry here. I know it. Um, but the design behind the elevation is to be like when you go to a movie theater. When you go to a movie theater, the speakers are on the wall angled towards you for the best possible listening experience. They're not in the wall shooting straight out. They're not in the ceiling shooting straight down. They're angled towards the listening position. So the prime elevation is a speaker that can be used for your front speaker. It can be for your side speaker. It can be for your height effect speakers. It can even go on its side kind of in a corner if you're trying to hide it more. And the design is to give you that completely immersive experience like you have at the movie theater and blend in with all the other speakers around you. It, it's the best thing I've done to my theater since Blu-ray came out and introduced Dolby Atmos. And what it does is it takes you, one of my favorite movies to demo back in the day on DVD was this movie Dragonheart with uh, Randy Quaid and Sean Connery. And there's a sequence, or, yeah, Dennis, yeah, Dennis Quaid, not Randy Quaid, not the one from uh, <laughs> Vacation. Um, but there's a sequence where Draco the Dragon is flying around and uh, he's speaking. And when he does, he goes from speaker to speaker. And in a 5.1, you hear it in the front speaker, 
and then there's this gap and he shows up behind you and then there's a gap and he shows up on the other side and comes around. But with the, the elevation and the height effect speakers, it fills in that gap and it brings you to a completely immersive bubble. And it, it's a really cool experience. And uh, you ever been in a movie where you've turned to see where something is coming from? That's what you get when you do introduce uh, height effect speakers. Yeah, and I think there's been uh, a lot more content that's uh, come out. Obviously, music now, a lot of the streaming services are adopting uh, spatial audio or 3D audio, and and obviously Dolby Atmos has, has been huge in pushing uh, music as well. So it's really becoming, I think, one of the more exciting developments uh, in the way it's being embraced and adapted. And uh, I really hope video games can uh, can start really making a push uh, of it because I feel like there's a lot to be gained there uh, in terms of gameplay for for people who are uh, you know immersed in that sort of bubble of sound. It, it really kind of gives you a different experience than than what you even get from surround sound. Um, oh, it's super cool video game. My kid, the PS5 and the Xbox are in here, and my kids are they play in here instead of downstairs uh, in their room, and because of the sound experience. Spider Man on a PS5, unbelievable. So, Russell, I did want to spend a minute or two talking about the center channel speaker because I often feel like that that sometimes gets underrated as far as the importance within a home theater. And there's a lot of things about the center channel that can either make or break it. Uh, so I'm curious when when people come to you and they're, they're building out their home theater, what kind of uh, advice do you give them when choosing a center channel speaker? First and foremost, that center channel is the workhorse. 70% of your audio is where all your dialogue comes from. Uh, we have a lot of customers that complain that when I watch TV and the sound effects come on or music comes on, the uh, you know gun shooting, whatever it be, I can't hear what people are saying. And what's happening is all those surround sound effects are being dumped into your front television and being covered up. So what that center channel does in that surround sound is takes where your dialogue is and gives it its own channel. And so again, it's the workhorse of the system. It's so when we're talking to our customers, I. Uh, uh, that 5.1, that 3.1, that 7.2.4, whatever that would be, that center channel is always included in those multi-channel audios because that dialogue is so important for your movie and television watching. When, we, when we're talking about matching up speakers, our first, our, another thing we talk about is timbre matching, making sure that if you're buying an SVS Ultra set of towers, match that with your SVS Ultra Center. We got the same material. We have the same crossovers that are sent in. We're going to get the same volume and the same uh, same color when we're listening to that music or listening to that movie out of all of those speakers. We want all that to match. And not just SVS. Again, if we're going to have someone go with the Bowers and Wilkins, they're going to go with the Klipsch, whatever. that we, we want to keep that timbre matching so it sounds correct. But that center channel is the absolute uh, cornerstone of making sure that you can hear what you're watching. So what we're seeing on our screen now is the uh, Ultra Center channel uh, from SVS. And uh, and Larry, that's a three-way design. Maybe walk through quickly what the difference is between a three-way design and a two-way design and what you gain uh, by having that, uh, that three-way uh, activation. Yeah, so we make two center channels as a brand. We have our Prime Series and our Ultra Series. And kind of going back to real quick what Russell was just saying about timbre matching, that's when you, you typically have similar drivers that blend together and all the speakers svs makes whether it's our our svs prime or the svs ultra series they will blend and timbre match just fine so what this uh, room here has is our prime pinnacle towers on the sides and the ultra center in the middle and then those are the prime elevation up above as front height effect speakers but the two center channels we make in both the prime and ultra use a three-way design so it's kind of hard to see in that picture, but there are two drivers on the outside. Those are the woofers, low frequencies. The middle on the bottom, that is our mid-range. And then in the top, in the center, that is the tweeter. And by having highs, mids, and lows inside a center channel, you get more frequency capabilities, better detail. But the big one is a wider sound stage. Most speakers you go and look at, you know, they go walk around NFM, your local retailer, wherever you're at, you'll find that most center channels use what's called a two-way design, which is typically two mid-range drivers on the outside and a tweeter in the middle. And they're great. They're going to do what they're designed to do. But the drawback is you're missing out on a lot of uh, frequency inside that because you don't have lows, mids, and highs. And it also creates a much more shallow uh, soundstage. So by this experience here with the highs, mids, and lows, 
uh, being separated and having a mid-range and a tweeter that are at different elevations there, you get a wider soundstage. So if you have a big sectional couch and a large family, you don't necessarily have to be in the sweet spot to experience the best dialogue coming from your center channel. I think that's great advice. And, and I think when uh, when Russell mentioned it's the workhorse, that really uh, sort of emphasizes the point that having that that broad soundstage and really sort of that uh, pinpoint accuracy and the ability to uh, you know really project the sound in a wide listening area uh, makes all the difference when you have a speaker that's doing that much work. So uh, important points raised to you by you guys there. Um, the other thing I did want to mention quickly while we're uh, just talking about speakers is uh, cable management. And uh, Russell, I know this is something that your team can help with greatly, but one of the biggest, uh, I guess, hurdles for a lot of people to overcome is I don't want wires going all throughout my room. Uh, so here we see what uh, looks almost like PVC, but it's like basically a conduit. What can you recommend for folks who want a clean aesthetic as far as their speaker setup goes? Build a new house. No, I, so <laughs> I, the, the, the panduit that you're looking at there uh, is a great way to put the speaker wire you need to. It's paintable. You're always going to see it. It's going to be there. But for somebody that wants to hide that isn't looking to punch holes in drywall, it is an option. Um, what we do uh, when my system designers and installers go to homes, we give all the options that we possibly can. Uh, sometimes we have a lot of customers that have a utility room sitting next to uh, their living room downstairs in the basement that we can fish wires through the ceiling, drop things down. Um, and I, I, nobody wants to hear this, but a little bit of drywall damage and repair afterwards, tied those cables, is something that you really should think about if you're building that theater experience. But for us, we always give the customer the option, always show them what's going to be, what you have to look at, what you don't have to look at, but there's always an option out there to hide something. And I know subwoofers, there's a, that's probably the hardest thing to hide to make look like it belongs. Uh, and I know SVS, I don't know if you're going to talk about this now or later, but SVS has a fantastic option for that wireless subwoofer adapter. Gives us a placement option wherever it needs to go, transmitter that sits up uh, where the audio video receiver is, and then you put that subwoofer anywhere in the room, plug it in, uh, and that wireless uh, transmitter allows me to put that subwoofer in something that, you know, either an ideal placement for getting the best sound or keeping it out of the way of a spot where there might be somebody in the house that doesn't want to look at it. Russell, I think Bottom. you read my mind because we have the perfect segue <laughs> to the next part of our discussion here. We are SVS, and uh, for those who don't know, uh, we started about 20, uh, a little over 20 years ago as a subwoofer manufacturer in a Youngstown, Ohio garage. So we know a little something about bass and uh, in making quality subwoofers. Uh, we've actually become the number one subwoofer manufacturer in the U.S. and uh, close to the world here now. So uh, super proud of that. But what is a subwoofer? A subwoofer is a speaker essentially that exclusively makes bass. Now, why is that important? Well, if you watch a blockbuster movie, if you like certain types of music, bass holds the rhythm. It provides a tactile sort of tangible feel to uh, to the music and content. It actually lets you uh, like perceive the energy in the room in a way that can make the hair on your arm stand up or even shake your pant legs. It's it's what adds thrill and excitement. So. We get a little uh, excited when we talk about uh, subwoofers and bass, uh, but there's a lot of nuance to bass as well. I think uh, some people have sort of a, a notion that it's, you know, it's the guy driving down the street in his car and it's this doo -doo -doo, this big bloated sort of boomy sound. That's not at all the kind of bass that, uh, that you can get in your home theater that really makes a difference. In fact, I think sometimes the subtle, quiet, sort of ominous, you know, uh, notes that you can hear and feel uh, are often more immersive than some of those big loud explosions that you see because they really draw you in even further. So with all that being said, now that I've hyped you up about why bass is so great, Larry, I'll kick it to you. When people are considering a subwoofer, what are the, some, some of the general things they should think about? And then we'll get into some of the more detailed uh, aspects of ported versus sealed, et cetera. But just in general, what, uh, what should people think about? Well, you know, when you're looking at a subwoofer, you got to think about your room. And... You know, depending on the size of your room, we're going to go into ported versus sealed here in a minute. But, you know, if you've got a large room, you're probably going to need a larger subwoofer or multiple subwoofers. So make sure you kind of kind of keep that in mind. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But, you know, are you listening to music? Are you doing movies? Is this a multi-purpose room? I, because it can make a difference. And I don't know if you want me to hit on sealed versus ported right now. But what you're looking at is a, a sealed subwoofer on the left versus our ported subwoofer on the right. And they're both great at everything you want to throw at them. 
the difference between really a sealed sub and a ported sub is the sealed sub is a completely enclosed ecosystem. So all of the air movement is isolated inside the cabinet. And it's great for every, one of our favorite phrases we say is a sealed sub is great at everything and poor at nothing because it will deliver everything you want in your music, movies, gaming experiences. It will be there at low volumes, it will be there at loud volumes. And it's very fast and very accurate when it comes to quick transient bass, which is the fast bass notes in a guitar, uh, maybe a machine gun in a movie, something like that. But there are instances where a sealed sub either is not enough or you may need multiples. And that tends to come into larger rooms or if you're trying to uh, take on maybe an open concept space. And that's where the ported subwoofers come into play. So we do both. We do sealed and ported. And we have another model that is a cylindrical subwoofer. And it is also ported. And when you go from a sealed sub to a ported sub in SVS, what you get is a deeper output in the bass in regards to the frequency. So say the sealed sub hits that num that 20 hertz number, and we won't go too geeky, but that's kind of the golden number you want to hit as a subwoofer because that's the bass you no longer hear. That's the bass you feel. And when you go from maybe one of our sealed models that hits 20, when you go to the ported sub, it's going to go lower. It might go down to 20 uh, to 17 or maybe even a little bit lower than that. So what that gains is more output for you at lower volumes, more depth, and whenever you start to crank it, the ported subwoofers are much louder at the same volume level as the sealed sub. So if you have, if you're doing an AB shootout, the, the ported sub will always be louder and will go a little bit deeper, but the sealed sub may be a little bit more accurate. But there is a thing that we do that's a little different than most of the other brands are going to encounter on the market. All of our ported subwoofers on the market today can do both, meaning they can be a ported subwoofer for the big, huge, over-the-top over the IMAX experiences, or that we have a feature inside our subwoofer control app where uh, we will send you these foam port plugs that go inside those ports you see there, and you can keep the ports open and extended for those huge, over-the-top theatrical experiences you want. But when you're trying to do that tight, refined, quick, more responsive base of music, you can plug those ports, go into our app, and actually physically change the way the subwoofer operates from a ported subwoofer to a sealed subwoofer. And it's really awesome. It's something you can do to maximize floor space uh, for all your experiences and really be more versatile in your subwoofer use. So I'm not sure if you mentioned this, Larry. Uh, what we're looking at is our 3000 series subwoofers. They have the same size driver, the same power amplifier, but a ported subwoofer's cabinet is always going to be larger, obviously to make room for those ports that are uh, basically moving air. So that's another thing to consider. If it's a smaller room, then the sealed subwoofer is going to be a more compact solution that you can put under furniture or to this, you know, off to the side, a little bit easier to place uh, than the ported subwoofer. And some people even choose to go dual with uh, with the sealed models, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but yeah, so the, there's just another factor to consider there as far as your room size goes. And, and one other thing I'll mention is that the sealed subwoofers can actually benefit from something called room gain, which means if you place it properly, you can actually hit deeper notes and get greater output by just using the room and the bass reflections that are happening within it. And uh, you'll wanna tune it correctly so it doesn't become sort of boomy, but it is an advantage of using the sealed cabinet subwoofer where the room itself will actually emphasize the base and give you more output and deeper extension than you would typically get from what it's rated at. So, um, you know, you can work with the NFM folks or somebody from the SVS team to really get that dialed in, but it's, uh, it's definitely a feature that um, sealed subwoofers benefit from. So I mentioned dual subwoofers. And when you're talking about taking your experience to the next level, I think people might assume, well, you go dual subwoofers, you're gonna get more output. And yes, you certainly will, but that's not actually the main benefit. Russell, why would you use dual subwoofers? What's the biggest gain you could have from having dual subwoofers? So for our customers, it is rare that somebody builds a room, puts one chair, and then they're the only one watching it. The only <laughs> one in that room. Not saying it's never happened, as a weirdo but what generally happens is we have multiple speeding seating areas and the great thing about two subwoofers is base distribution uh again geeking out a little bit the smaller driver you have a tweeter is going to have a smaller wave and it's going to sound very consistent through the room no matter where you go with the sub you've got a much larger wave that moves through the room and so when it's at its peak it's where you feel it the most that punch in the chest feeling so if you've ever been in a room and you're seating and you can really feel it, you stand up and walk two steps away and it's just thin, it's not there anymore. That's because that base wave is at that trough. So what you 
an ideal situation is putting a second sub in the room and uh, either positioning it or changing its phase to where it is evenly distributing. So your base waves are moving like this through the room. So one's at peak, one's at trough. And this is one of the things that sets SVS apart from a lot of their competitors is instead of having just a switch to change that phase on that uh, base wave, I can go in with my phone, sit in my favorite spot and change my subwoofer settings to give me the best sound for where I'm sitting and sitting in the next chair and doing that with. And so when one is set at, let's say a zero, the other is set at 180 degrees off of that, I'm getting that base wave or that base distribution through the room like I should. So for us, when we're talking to a customer about uh, doing a, a second subwoofer in the room, it really is making sure that everybody is having this, a similar experience no matter where they sit in that room. If you have uh, an elevated second row, you have a sectional in that room. It For us, it's all about keeping that same experience everywhere in that room. No, I think that's a great point. I mean, when you're talking about getting that truly convincing realistic effect, uh, you know, bass should be omnidirectional. It's not something where you sit, close your eyes, you can point and be like, that's where the subwoofer is. It should sound like this bass is coming from all around you. Every single speaker is being supported by these low frequencies that the subwoofer is presenting to the point where it's completely seamless. You just have no idea where that subwoofer is in a room. And sometimes with one subwoofer, if the placement's not done correctly, then you do have some bit of localization where duals uh, really sort of irons all of that out and, and makes it a non-issue. Um, but we did mention placement and uh, we're getting on to about 15 minutes and there's lots of great questions. So I do want to speed things up. But Larry, why don't you quickly walk through uh, placement tips for a subwoofer? Uh, maybe mention the subwoofer crawl technique, but try to keep this quick so we can get to some of these. Yeah, awesome absolutely. Questions. And I saw going back to the dual subs real quick. This came up a bunch in the comments. You want to make them be the same. You don't want to mix and match ported Absolutely. versus sealed. If you're throwing in a brand K and a brand S or a brand B and mixing them, they're going to be totally different. And one of them will overpower the other. So if you can, you want them to be the exact same. And then when it comes to placement, you know, if you're just doing a single subwoofer, typically a corner is going to be pretty good for it. Um, but if you're doing multiples, finding the best spot is key. Or if you're really trying to fine tune your room, doing the subwoofer crawl is it's quite fun and also uh, interesting to experience, especially if somebody doesn't know what you're doing. Uh, so the subwoofer crawl, you physically pick up your subwoofer and put it either in your chair or directly in front of your main listening position. And then you put on a tune or a like use an app to do a sound generator of a tone and you walk around your room or technically you're supposed to get on your hands and knees and crawl around the room. I don't do that. I already look goofy enough as it is. I don't need to do. <laughs> it's yeah, not the subtle for walk knees. technique. It's yes, crawl so technique. short. You know, I don't need to get results. Yeah, all you guys that are over six feet tall, you do need to get on your hands and knees. But when you know you're five six, it's not that big a deal. But you walk around your room or crawl around your room, and you find the point in the room where you're just getting bombarded with the bass. Not necessarily loud, but you're feeling it throughout your body. Maybe even pressurizing your ears, and when you find that spot that's the most intense, that's where your subwoofer needs to go. And then when you put it back in that space, you will get that experience when you're sitting down in your chair. And if you're doing two, you do the exact same thing a second time. So you add that second one, walk around and find the point for that too. And then there will be a great balanced sound throughout the space. Good information there, Larry. So, Russell, I know you mentioned our uh, wireless adapter, which is one way that you can reduce cable clutter as far as your subwoofer goes and sort of make a cleaner install. But that's not the only way you can trick out your subwoofer. Do you know what we're looking at here on the screen? That's your isolation system. So why would you <laughs> want to decouple your subwoofer? What does it mean to decouple and in what scenario would you benefit from uh, adding these sporty little uh, feet to your sub? Absolutely. So... When we're talking about something that's generating any type of noise, if you're connecting two surfaces and you have that vibration, that vibration is going to go from, from object A to object B through that, through that hard connection. Uh, so if you've ever had, uh, you can hear somebody talking in the wall because that drywall is attached to the stud, which is attached to the drywall. It's those hard surfaces carrying those vibrations through. If I can take that object that's generating that noise and decouple it, essentially find a way to stop that vibration uh, going from surface to surface, I can not only reduce the amount of resonance that I get through the house, through other rooms, but by isolating it, I get a 
better tone. It is isolating that device. So you're also going to see this not on here, but I'm not going to say we haven't sold these for also record players. Uh, same idea. <laughs> we should. We should. So the idea is anytime I can isolate that and reduce that amount of vibration uh, transition, it's absolutely what we want. Yeah, and I see some comments in here saying that that should just automatically be on a subwoofer, and it's not needed for everybody, so that's mm -hmm. why it's not. The only models in our lineup that they're already included on are the cylinders, and somebody was asking what the cylinders are. Uh, if one of our port sealed subs is, say, a 12-inch cube, the ported version of it is going to be more like an 18-inch cube, so they grow in size by about 60%. So the cylinder, instead of being you know, a foot and a half, two feet deep in some cases, it's 16 inches in diameter and it's tall. So it kind of looks like a tall Alexa device. And because it's also down firing, this isolation system is already installed on there to give a little bit more room uh, between where the driver sits at the bottom aiming down. Uh, so they're great. They're, like Russell said, I use them on my turntables. They're actually on my components that are stacked too, but mm -hmm. it really makes you a better neighbor and prevents a lot of that base from escaping and tighten up a room, but not every subwoofer needs it. So that's why it's yeah. not included on every model. Yeah, and, that and that's a great point. That cylinder sub is gorgeous. It is absolutely a way to start a conversation. That is an icebreaker walking <laughs> yeah, into That's really room. cool. If you got a funky room, like my TV in my living room sits in a corner on a stand. And when we rearranged the room, I didn't really have a great spot for the sub. So I went with the cylinder back behind it. You have no idea it's even there. It's a really cool experience. So the wireless adapter, we have the subwoofer isolation system, uh, which not only helps clean up the base and get rid of room rattle, but helps you be a better neighbor, which I think uh, you had mentioned there, Larry. Um, you know, and uh, you know, subwoofers can be a lot of fun. And uh, you know, I know uh, somebody had asked Russell if uh, people at NFM can help sort of navigate these uh, choices that you have to make, and then help set up a surround sound system. I believe that's a resounding yes. That is a resounding yes. I'm not I'm not going to really toot our home this much but uh we've done very well with svs subwoofers we have uh we have sold a ton of them but more importantly it has become a bread and butter for us because it's it gives everybody an option from a small room and that's the small you know 2002 i want to rattle fillings loose i want to bug my neighbor's neighbor we can do that for you with a 16 ultra but when we have customers coming in and not sure not only do i have a whole home theater staff that is uh, very, very well trained on what to look for. But I have my system designers that work specifically for me that do custom designs for, uh, for homes as well that can walk you through, sit you down, and uh, you tell us what you want, we'll show you exactly what's gonna work best for you. Yeah, so I would say it's a great idea. Bring pictures of your room, go into one of the NFM showrooms, say, you know, this is what I'm working with. Uh, you know, start listening to some speakers and uh, you'll get the recommendations that are best for you. Um, yep. So we're not going to go too far into calibration because I think, you know, when people buy a receiver and they set up all their speakers, it's sort of self-explanatory how to set up the mic and everything. So I don't want to go too far into that. But Larry, I did want to ask, because you have some great tips where if you have run your room calibration already, uh, which is basically setting up a microphone, sending a series of test tones to the speakers, and it sort of level matches them to the, uh, to the extent that it's going to make it sound as good as possible, but it's not always the end game. Before we get into our Q&A, what are your best tips for post calibration adjustments that you should be looking to make to really get that next level immersive experience. I'll make this super quick because we have some awesome questions. But first and foremost is I, I typically don't trust what it says. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, I want to go in there and I want to verify. So, you know, if you've got tower speakers, like the ones behind me are about my shoulder level behind me here, the receiver recognized them as large, but they don't have large drivers. There's six and a half inch woofers in there. So I set it to small. I same thing with my center channel. I'm sorry, I'm going out of focus. I'm moving my hands a lot. Um, the receiver recognizing speakers as large is a big one. If you're not running massive speakers that have 12 inch drivers in them, they're small. I don't care what brand they are. They're going to be small on your receiver. Uh, then adjusting some levels, you know, whether it's uh, something that's further away from you or closer to you, checking those distances as the receiver uh, recognized it and verify, oh yeah, that one's 13 feet away, that one's 16 feet away, and adjust that accordingly. If you want a little bit more experience, maybe bump up your rear speakers, the levels a little bit, and uh, maybe even your height effects so that at lower volume levels, there's a little bit more there. But a big one, the first thing I'm gonna tell you to do is before you start it, turn your subwoofer down. And the reason for that is the receiver's gonna 
put that signal out of the subwoofer and it's going to go, okay, that thing's huge. It's too much. So it's going to end up pulling the output down to that subwoofer. And then if you don't go back and change it, you're going to be kind of underwhelmed. So I say, turn down the volume on the subwoofer. And then after it's done, go back and pull it back up, change the speakers to small uh, because most of us, sorry, most of us are going to be using speakers that don't have 12 inch drivers in them anymore. So switch it to small and then test your levels. So it's uh, it's just something in there and play with, and then adjust all the time. Get it to where you like it, and once you have it, and done, also I'd say you anytime know. you add a new component, a new speaker, a new anything, always rerun calibration. It's going to change the dynamics of how things interact, and you're going to want to do that to uh, to get the best performance possible. Russell, anything to add before we start this lightning round Q and A? We had the conversation earlier about the cars. You know how I I usually equate it to cars. Calibration is that same thing. The difference of a basic calibration out of a, a standard uh, retail receiver versus an advanced calibration out of a higher end using a small mass manufactured little plastic microphone versus a studio tune microphone makes all the difference. And Larry, you're the exact thing that I talk to customers about is do you want it the way it's supposed to be that this person thinks it should be? Or do you want that experience where, no, I really want to hit that low note. I really want my surround sounds to really fire off. It's a difference on that, what I want calibrated or what do I want in the experience? Two different things. They don't always line up for the customer. That's all That's I think. That's good stuff. Uh, all right, let's dive right in here. Our first question comes from Donna M. And I feel like she's got a, a dream scenario here. Her movie room is in the basement with cement walls. Is that okay, Larry? Absolutely. Crank that up. It's you the best, be right? Neighbors quite as it's much. like a, you're in a you're in a bunker. Like that's the yeah. best possible scenario. I mean, no Put a couple of ported so. subs down there and blow that place up. You're yep. good to go, Donnie. You won't be able to put in walls in there, but uh, find some stands, get yourself set up, and you'll be in a good scenario. And find a way yes. to yep something put on the walls. Make oh, sure there you go. Cement walls are fantastic. Boy, do they echo. We got a lot of options for you to make sure that you don't get that reflection. But no, I'm I'm with you too. Cement walls. Yeah, blow it up. All right, Mike M asks, uh, he ran Odyssey on his Denon and the Ultra Towers are saying they're hooked up wrong and out of phase. What could be causing that? Larry? Uh, it does that a lot on a lot of systems. So sometimes it's just the way that maybe a reflection in your room or something like that. You can click ignore. You know, if it recognizes that it's out of phase, what that, if it is out of phase, typically you check your wire to make sure your positive and negative aren't switched. Uh, or on the back of the ultra towers, there's these binding clips between the two posts on the back. Make sure they're nice and tight. And then uh, if it's all correct, just ignore it and keep moving. Russell, you're allowed to take a pass on this one since it may put people to sleep. But Josh asks, <laughs> what about HDMI 2.1? Do we need to, what do we need to know? Anything? Uh, so the, the first thing to know about HDMI 2.1 is it's not all the same. So HDMI 2.1 has a number of variances on what you're looking for. Not all HDMI 2.1 is built the same, but the big things are uh, 4K at 60 Hertz and being able to do 8K and being able to uh, pass the 48 gigs of information through that. So a lot of those basics are there, but when we start talking about the nitpicky, you know, backwards compatibility flags uh, for uh, authentication, all that gets a little, little wonky. But when we're talking audio video receivers specifically, uh, that is definitely something, if you're hooking up a device that uh, is touting that it has HDMI 2.1, such as the Xbox Series X, such as a PS5, such as a, a graphics card you put in that you're hooking up to a device through a surround sound receiver that is outputting uh, that high res, high frame rate, then absolutely make sure it has that. But uh, we have customers that are buying today that are never gonna buy a PS5, that are always gonna be using that. We still say, future proof because your next cable box satellite receiver apple tv whatever it might be will use that hdmi 2.1 so it is something you need to make sure you do on your next receiver next television Wait, next everything I, you taught me something there because i i've been just seeing 2.1 2.1 and i'm like what do i need to know about this but uh you just cleared it up there so thank you all right larry here's one i haven't heard before if you're running three identical towers as an lcr in the front stage is there any reason the center tower should not be placed horizontally or should it be placed horizontally no you you want them all standing the exact same way because there is definitely a thought process behind keeping everything level but if you take a speaker that's designed to be upright and lay it down or even vice versa 
it totally changes the waves. It changes the way the sound comes out. And it's also going to create some extreme reflec reflections, reflections. Yeah. Let's, let's say that reflections. Yeah. And, and I think on... another important point to remember is always trying to align those tweeters on the same plane in that front stage is going to just help the continuity of the sound coming from left to center to right. Um, yep. So when you lay a you know tower on its side, it's obviously going to throw things into uh, you know all sorts of haywire. But even if you're running a traditional center channel like our Ultra Center, uh, try to get that at the same level as the tweeters in your Ultra Towers, or your Prime Pinnacles, or whatever tower speakers you're running. Uh, all right, Russell, what do you use for TV calibration? And I'm not sure if that's like a tool or if it's more just a thought process, but uh, open-ended question there for you. So CalKing software is, is one of those pretty well-known pieces of software out there. Uh, so when we're calibrating a TV, best case scenario, some of the newer TVs like the Sonys, uh, the OLEDs, the LG OLEDs, uh, the QLEDs uh, from Samsung, uh, they have a piece of software built into it, which is fantastic for us because we show up as a camera suction cups to the front of the tv we hook up the uh the laptop it recognizes the calking software and does a calibration uh so what it will do is if you're a real nerd you've seen the triangle the red blue green triangle and we pick points on there and say this is the color i need to recreate and so when it's done it'll create a chart to say how close to that color can i get and so when we calibrate with that calking software, it's generating that light that it should out of the panel. That camera is capturing that light and then changing, uh, changing the calibration in the TV to make sure that light output matches what the camera should be picking up. And funny enough, OLED is one of the uh, technologies that errors out in one color and that's black because it's a camera, it needs light to hit it to say, hey, I'm seeing something. But because it's a self-lit pixel and turns off, it doesn't see anything. It errors out. And I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. But <laughs> um, calibration, look, just like I was talking to you, Larry, about, hey, there's a sometimes the calibrated isn't exactly what the customer wants. No different than a calibrated TV. Sometimes we'll calibrate either a day or a night node. People look at it and go, it just looks dim. It's because you've been watching it on Vivid for so long. You don't, you don't see that punchy colors. What's great about most TVs now is that calibrated mode stays as a mode that you can switch it back to. So if you want to watch your sports and you want to watch uh, whatever that would be in that punchy mode, but then, hey, we're putting in that movie and I want to make sure I'm watching it in the proper mode, we can move it back to that calibrated mode and then move on with life and everybody's happy. I know I said I'd be punctual, but there's a couple more good questions. So give me right. five more minutes, guys. I know you, you don't look like you're uh, losing energy yet. So yeah, we're good. <laughs> keep the train moving. Uh, Peter asks, how much of a difference is there between 5.2.2 and 5.2.4? And I'll take this one. That basically means an extra pair of Dolby Atmos speakers. And I'd say, you know, it depends on the size of your room. If you have a long or a large room and you have a large seating area, you're going to want, you know, four channels of Dolby Atmos. It'll provide just a, a broader dome of sound. Whereas if it's a smaller room and you can align either your elevations on either side or have, uh, you know, overhead in, in ceiling speakers directly over the seating area, you're probably fine with just two. And we've even seen people like we showed on one of the uh, earlier photos, mount them in the front or mount them in the rear. So I'd say if it's a large room, go with four. If it's a smaller room, you're probably good with two, but you can always upgrade if you have enough channels in your yep. receiver. Um, this gets back to one of the conversations we were having earlier. Larry, does lack of amplifier power impact sound quality? Y yes and no. Um, if you, yeah, so maybe. Um, if, you, you know, if you've got more power, you're obviously going to be able to drive your speakers more efficiently. Uh, you won't have to go quite as loud. When you go louder, it'll be uh, a little bit more detailed. Um, but you know, most people, if you're if you're buying really anything that's sitting there behind Russell from SVS, most off-the-shelf receivers are going to handle our stuff just fine. When you do start moving into the Ultra Series products, they are a little bit more power hungry. So if you if you step up an amplification, it will just it'll take care of more of the sensitivity on the speaker deliver a, a little bit better experience all the way around. But when you do start growing and going typically beyond seven speakers, the, the more amplification you you have will be better for you all the way around. And, that's and not only that, if, if you like to crank it, you know, if you're underpowering yes. your speakers and you're trying to play it, you know, at very high volumes, you're going to get distortion. It's just not going to be able to handle it. So, um, you know, keep that in mind when you're uh, talking to your NFM rep about your listening preferences. And if you like to go reference volume all the time, you want to want a little bit more power than uh, than the yes. typical off-the-shelf receiver. Yep. 
and Nick, for for us generally, when I when I'm talking about amplification, it's decibels versus frequency response. I can make a speaker go loud, but do I want to be at a reasonable volume and get the most recreation out of that music that I want? And that'll be the difference between wattage and amplification. And it's a really bad old joke, but we sell amplifiers, not wattifiers. So <laughs> watts don't mean anything. It's an amplification Ooh. is a big thing. I know. I know. Yuck, yuck. See, we, people didn't know they were getting a comedy show. That's good. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy asks, uh, he's got a 5.1.2 with a pair of elevations on the sides. On his Yamaha receiver, there are choices for the front wall or the ceiling. Is there a difference between those two settings, and which one should he choose, Russell? So he's got, you said front elevations, uh, front and? He's got the them side? positioned on the side, but the options in the receiver are front wall or ceiling. Oh, Okay. Yeah, Yamaha uh, has some interesting settings. Yeah. So one one thing I'll point out is if we're setting up an Atmos system, your first set or first pair of heights are always front. So you don't you'll never put your rear speakers or side speakers as your first set of heights. When when you look at a Dolby Atmos spec, your front two are always your front heights. Your first two are always your front heights. So if I had them to the side, I would use personally I would use those as side surround is what I would do. But I would put them on, it says wall or ceiling, I'd put them on wall. Well, I think what he's going into there is the Yamaha receiver itself, the setting. So like uh, we tend to recommend Den and Morant's most of the time because they have a front, a middle, a rear setting. Mm -hmm. And on the Yamaha, it's either front or ceiling. So in the case of the user was asking there, based on where they're placed, uh, I would say ceiling. Put, use ceiling option. Yeah. I see. Oh, yep. There you go. Yep. That's, uh, go. I mean, it shows why the folks at uh, NFM are so important because you get these different settings and different receivers and you're sort of navigating your path, but uh, it, it was a good question. So mm -hmm. I think we have two more here. Uh, and this one's for you, Russell. Chris asks, what's your opinion on mounting front speakers behind a projector screen? So the right projector screen works out great. So what's called an audio transparent screen. So, or micro perforated. Uh, so the advantage of doing that is if I have uh, a screen that is just taking up most of the wall, that I don't have a spot for floor standing speakers or a spot to have uh, in-wall speakers on either side, an audio perforated or an audio transparent screen is a fantastic option. Uh, the drawback to that is, of course, a uh, lowered reflective output. So I don't have as much light coming back to me. So I need to make sure my projector has enough brightness to counteract that. But we do this numerous times to where we do a, a micro perforated screen or audio transparent screen. Absolutely an option. And it is worth noting that if you don't have an acoustically transparent st stream, it will actually affect the sound quality. You'll you'll mess with the frequency response. So don't just choose, you know, uh, a teacher's, you know, overhead projector screen and, and try to, you know, get that to work <laughs> in your home theater uh, because you will distort the sound there in a way that's uh, that's not natural. Funny enough, it'll um, sound just like speakers behind a screen. Yeah, imagine that. Just like like that. Imagine that. Imagine that. Uh, yep. So here's a quick question from Carson. He asked, will our wire, uh, SoundPath wireless adapter we were talking about earlier work with powered speakers? The answer is yes. It actually passes a full range signal. So while it does work phenomenally well with the LFE track with subwoofers, it will also work with powered speakers. So I think we have yeah. one more from TJ. Well, I want to hit on the wireless thing. If you're doing two subs, if you're going to do one wireless, they both should be wireless. Otherwise, there will be a discrepancy in the speed, not necessarily a sound quality, but the way that the signal is reached to the subwoofer. Good point. Yep. We want to make sure they're aligned, uh, time aligned. And that's the uh, one way to make sure if you're going wireless that uh, that is the case. Uh, Russell, Elizabeth asks, what advice would you give someone who has a very small room when buying a system? Uh, as many speakers as will physically fit. If you could walk this way into the room and sit down, it'd be I Now, um, so when we talk about a small room, let's say it's an office, uh, sometimes a sound bar works great. Something that's just gonna amplify that sound better than what the TV speakers are gonna do. Sound bar is a very reasonable option, I think, for, for a lot of people uh, that, and especially in a small room that they don't have the wire run. Uh, or if you're gonna be sitting down to where the only spot for a speaker is going to be next to your ears, it's not going to be a pleasant experience. So depending on what your seating arrangement is going to be, a 5.1 system, if you have room behind it, Larry's a great example of this, of, of the room he's in right now. There's enough room to sit away from a rear wall. There's enough room to put sit somewhere else. 
Um, but we have a number of customers that will come in and say, my couch is against my back wall and that's the only place that I can put a speaker. Sometimes that, that sound bar that simulates Dolby Atmos or simulates surround sound is the best option for that room. But when it comes down to it, a surround sound experience always sounds better with actual surround sound speakers, but that's not always the best option for that particular uh, configuration of the room. No, it's a great point. I mean, sometimes stereo is the best option or a sound bar with a, a couple of rear speakers and a sub. You know, it's it's all a matter of preference, but uh, anyone who's committed to better sound, there's a solution for you that's going to be far superior than your TV speakers that will fit in any size room. So uh, just make the jump and you won't be sorry. And I saw uh, something come up real quick out of the wireless question, talked about doing multiples. So our wireless kit, and I know I'm going to go out of focus again, is designed to have multiples in the room. Somebody asked if having multiple multiple wireless kits is going to cause interference. They are designed to have a transmitter and up to six receivers for wireless audio, and they'll, they won't interfere with each other. Great point. Uh, all right. I will take the uh, last question from TJ. He asked, uh, do you want dual subs for critical listening of music or home theater only? And, uh, you know, I think if you're sitting in a room with a single chair, like sort of that old uh, Maxell ad where you have two speakers, you can probably get by with a single subwoofer to, you know, optimize it for placement and get it dialed in and calibrated where, you know, the, the base is perfect right there. But a lot of folks who are running high performance two channel audio file systems, they like having stereo base to match that up. It just provides a, uh, a more even experience. And uh, I'd say, you know, it's absolutely something to consider, not mandatory, uh, but definitely something that will enhance the sound stage and, and give you all the output that you would ever need, as well as the things you were mentioning, Russell, about more even bass response throughout the entire listening area, not just that one seat. Um, so I think it's an important point to mention there. That's it, fellas. I think we got to a lot of information, but there's still so much we didn't get to. I don't know, Russell, are we going to have to do this again sometime? Maybe a 301 level down the road? <laughs> I think I think there. if it's not me, somebody's going to be able to do a great job. I know I'm just going to miss you guys if it isn't. Excellent. Well, we have uh, our giveaway for the evening, our Prime Satellite 5.1 system. Uh, the winner of our system tonight is Aaron Deer. Congratulations, Aaron Deer. You got yourself an awesome, awesome. 5.1 system and subwoofer to uh, rock out to with uh, your new home theater. So congratulations to Aaron. Uh, we appreciate all the comments. The uh, energy here was awesome. Like I said, hopefully we'll be able to do this again sometime soon. Uh, thank you, Larry. And thank you, Russell, for staying a little bit extra uh, time for tonight. And I encourage you. Go check out some of those NFM showrooms. You'll get to experience Dolby Atmos. You'll get to experience short throw projectors, big 8K screens, everything you could possibly want. Uh, Russell, anything you want to tease the folks with before we adjourn tonight as far as uh, big news uh, with NFM here coming down the pipeline? Hey, it's been announced. We are, uh, in addition to our Dallas and our Kansas City location, we are going to be opening as soon as we possibly can our Austin location. We're super excited about that. Uh, we're going to start seeing much, much bigger TVs on our floor, 98-inch direct view televisions Woo! from Samsung and others. Come in and see us. We're going to show you the best stuff, the newest stuff, and we're going to show you how to get it up and running. Very, Very cool. good. And if you didn't get enough of this geekery, uh, Larry and I will actually be doing what's called the SVS Audiophile Happy Hour tomorrow night on our YouTube and Facebook. So feel free to come check us out with uh, our president. We'll have a special guest, more giveaways. So your chance to take home free SVS gear. Super excited about that. That's 6 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow night on the SVS Facebook and YouTube. So thanks again, gentlemen. Thank you to all the NFM and SVS community out there who joined us tonight. Uh, we look forward to doing this again down the road. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Nick, Larry, goodbye. Right. See ya. Bye, everybody. Yeah.